In uh, <coughs> the Paris notebooks, he has a section uh, on page 78 following where he distinguishes three forms of, of communism. I think, as, as you may have seen yourself, although he distinguishes three forms of communism, it's hard to get a sense of how this, what the second form is, is supposed to be in distinction from either the first or the third. And exactly what the third is is something that uh, remains. Well, uh, somewhat difficult to lay a handle on. The first form of communism that's identified uh, may be... Uh, fleshed out sufficiently to give you an idea of why the Paris manuscripts, or also called the 1844 manuscripts, were not permitted to be published during the reign of uh, the Soviet Union. I have no idea whether they'd been published in China, let alone North Korea or Cuba in more recent times. But if you look at the first characterization of communism, Marx speaks of it as being just merely a universalization and fulfillment of private property. And he speaks of this as being a crude communism that he identifies with envy. He identifies it with envy as indeed the fulfillment of envy. He speaks of it as a leveling down according to an imagined minimum. It has a fixed and restricted standard. And it involves a kind of return to an unnatural simplicity of the poor man, bereft of needs, who has not even achieved private property, let alone gotten beyond it. Well, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a former community, he tells us on page 79, that is only a community of labor and of a quality of wages paid by the communal capital. We have the community as universal capitalists. And both sides, he tells us, are raised to an imaginary universality. That is, labor is the defined place of everyone. Capital is, in a sense, the recognized universality and power of the community. Well, what is he talking about? How is this realized? In a certain respect, one could say that this involves the achievement of, well, you could say the realization of something that Marx has pointed to earlier, both in uh, some indications in the 1840 more manuscripts and in the uh, um, German ideology, where he's spoken of the universality, I'm sorry, where he's spoken of the proletariat as having something universal in character. You may remember the universal character of the proletariat was in the sense that it didn't have a, a really particular interest of its own. Where it had something of its own to fight for over against the interests of other, uh, other groupings in, in, well, let's just call it society in general. Uh, it didn't because of what feature that was ascribed to the proletariat. What allowed it to figure as a universal class or a class that had a kind of universality? that would allow it also to be a kind of revolutionary subject that was not concerned in simply increasing its share against the shares of other groups with whom it stands in a kind of adversarial relationship, but to be something that, uh, in a sense, stands over and against the entirety of the status quo and thereby has nothing to lose but its own chains. What is it? that is described to the proletariat is tied to its supposed universality. Well, it's, it's alleged to be propertyless. Propertyless. Well, I mean, a slave has no property. A slave is an object of property. A worker who is a commodity has no property, but is owned by someone else. Well, we're going to want to ask ourselves whether this can possibly be an adequate way of thinking about a class in general, uh, a class of distinction from other types of groupings, a class specific to civil society. 
But here we're talking about a situation where indeed one could say the proletariat as a class has become universal. That is, we have a society in which a plurality of classes has been eliminated. How has it been eliminated? How do we achieve a classless society? Here. Superseding of private property. What? The superseding of private property. Well, when you say superseding of a private property, again, that can be. Um, I mean, Marx will speak of it in those terms, of course. But ultimately, what type of property is at stake here? Means of production. Exactly, ownership of the means of production. Because after all, if one is to say that the individuals in society, call them workers or not, are not to be slaves, they have to, in some respect, be acknowledged to own their own body. And not to have a body that's susceptible of appropriation by others. Moreover, if they're going to have anything to consume, let alone the clothes on their back, this is their property in a sense. If it's not to be something that anyone else can rip off them and freely dispose over. So in a sense, this talk about being devoid of property doesn't make sense unless one understands that what might alone plausibly be uh, at stake here is that we're talking about workers who do not own the means of production, either the object they work upon, let alone the instruments with which they work upon it. Of course, Marx now adds that they don't own their labor either. They give it up and in doing so become a commodity. Well, here one can speak of a classless society being established to the extent that everyone operates as a, a laborer. How can everyone, everyone without exception, be a worker? And in a sense, be in the exact same situation as before, except now it applies to everyone? How? Well, who now is the owner of capital? Or the owner of the means of production? Community. The community. Call it the state. How is that achieved? Well, you could call it nationalization of the means of production. Or another way of putting it, by eliminating private ownership of the means of production, everyone becomes a wage laborer. Everyone becomes a wage laborer. Everyone, in other, in other words, falls prey to this same kind of relationship. And moreover, we now have, as part and parcel of it, you could say the ideology of this nationalization of all, all means of production, or this elimination of class differences by making the proletariat the one and only class, making everyone, in other words, a wage laborer, is a notion that this is going to achieve inequality. Inequality that will reduce any disparities in the wages. Not, of course, that nationalization has anything to do with that, necessarily. You can have state ownership of the means of production and have any degree of disparity in wages, as, of course, you have had in the so-called historical socialist or communist regimes, where there's always been a tremendous degree of, well, uh, difference in the levels of ownership of uh, different workers and, of course, tremendous disparities and privileges, uh, given the nature of one-party rule and the like. But here in any event, the notion is that we have here envy uh, triumphing. Because here, the nationalization of commerce has taken place for the sake of putting everyone on the same level, making everyone a worker to begin with, putting everyone in the same functional role, in the same relationship, you could say of alienation and estrangement and everyone also receiving this artificial level of poverty. Everyone becomes equally impoverished under this situation. And everyone finds themselves submitting to the same kind of alienation and estrangement. You might ask yourself, well, OK, the community presides over everything, but you are still, in a sense, receiving a wage. Um, there are employees who are concerned with running affairs in the enterprises. Um, but everything could be said to be owned by uh, the community. Well, note that that ownership of the community does not alter the fundamental character of the relationship of individuals to their activity. 
At least Marx is willing to recognize that it doesn't. Now he points to a second form of, of uh, communism. And here he says it can either have political, it can either have a political nature, it could be democratic or despotic, or it could involve the abolition of the state. In either case, it remains incomplete. It remains afflicted with private property, with man's estrangement, which holds whether one, whether there is a state or there is no state. Um, but he says this communism already knows itself to be man's reintegration or return to himself, the superseding of human self-estrangement, but it has not yet grasped the positive nature of private property or understood the human nature of need and remains infected by private property. Now the question is, what, what is he here referring to that's in any way distinct from the first form of, of, of communism? What would he be referring to? I mean, there's very little to go on. But I'll point to other arrangements that you might consider and ask yourself whether they would make any difference. In other words, one can speak on the one hand of different ways of eliminating the relationship between privately owned means of production and the situation of those who work. And one can think of this being done on a, a national level in a centralized way, right? Which seems to presume that we are speaking about a kind of, well, universal community. On the other hand, you could think of arrangements that have a more particular scope. You could think of things arranged in a similar way in terms of independent communes, right? where you have smaller decentralized groupings, which communally uh, own the means of production and then employ their members. Of course, this raises issues in addition regarding how the different communes are to interact with one another and how one is to think about that, as well as what kind of inequalities could lay hold between the different kinds of communes, given their different situation and so forth. But again, it's very unclear what this amounts to. And the same could be said about the third, uh, the third notion of communism, which is here spoken of as the full positive superseding of private property, of human self-estrangement. Here you have what Marx calls the actual appropriation of the human essence by and for man. Now, how does that occur? How do we hear of the actual appropriation? You have the elimination of private ownership of the means of production through nationalization, but that did not eliminate the situation of alienation and estrangement. It made everyone a worker. It made everyone share the same kind of artificial level of restricted poverty and so forth. Well, here, supposedly, we have, Marx says, the completing conscious return of man to himself as a social, i.e., human being. This is accomplished, he says, with the entire wealth of the previous development. It depends upon all of that. And here now, he says, we have a fulfilled humanism that equals naturalism. We have the general resolution of the conflict of man and nature and a man with man, all these types of alienations that are alleged to occur in terms of the capital-labor relation are, are eliminated. Now they are resolved. Now exactly what is it that has been achieved? Well, he tells us that it's going to involve, in a sense, man's return away from religion, family, state, etc., to his human social existence. Note, the social existence is counterposed to religion, family, state, etc. Well, the question is, what is this social existence then? It doesn't involve any household institutions. It doesn't involve any political institutions. It doesn't involve any religion. It doesn't involve any of the etc. It just involves this social existence. Now the question is, what is this social existence? It's something in which he then goes on to say man's activity and enjoyment in their content and their mode of existence are social activity and social enjoyment. Only in social man do, does a natural and human existence coincide. Well, what does this mean? Now you might think that this would involve a situation where one's activity 
productive activity and one's consuming would in some respect be something that one does not engage in merely individually, but engages in such a way that one's activity is tied to the activity of everyone else, one's consumption is tied to the activity of everyone else. And you might ask, well, what would that involve? And how would it operate as a social relationship in distinction from a political relationship? I mean, for example, you could think of it to some degree in a kind of political administrative terms where everyone co-determines what productive activities are going to engage in and how the product will be uh, distributed. Everyone could have an equal say. Right? One could, of course, apply this to everything. Who will be your spouse? What decisions will be made regarding children, child rearing? What kind of entertainments will be produced? What kind of artworks will be produced, etc. Everything could be subject to the co-determination of everyone. Right? Note that in doing that, one might have a certain kind of, one could say, self-determination, but one would also forfeit the kind of freedom one has within other kinds of frameworks, such as one's freedom to join with someone else in a household and co-determine its affairs, or one's freedom to independently choose one's career or what activity one wants to pursue, or to choose what you want to consume individually, let alone to choose, well, what uh, political program you want to pursue, what kind of party you want to organize, and so forth and so on. But it's not clear. Marx doesn't say whether he's talking about that kind of in a sense, reduction of all types of self-determination to what might be thought of as a universal, collective, almost a political determination, which directly takes hold of all other spheres. Where there are no independent spheres, such as a household sphere or a social sphere, which is not directly subject to collective administration. But then one might ask, well, what, what else might this involve? How, what, how can one consider this, um, this social situation? And there's a remark towards the very end of, of our selection in the 1844 manuscripts. Remarks, to some degree, seems to be asking us to think about this situation. He says, you know, assume that we had produced as men, and this is on page 95 of our selection, then, if we really produced as men, not as alienated, estranged individuals, but as individuals at one with their species being, then each of us would have doubly affirmed him or herself and the other. And he says the following, I would have in my production objectified my individuality and its particular characteristics, and thus also enjoyed during the activity an individual expression of life, and in contemplating the object, had the individual joy of knowing my personality to be an objective, sensibly perceptible, and thus a power uh, raised beyond all doubt. But then, in addition to that, not only would I, in a sense, be aware of myself in my activity, but in your enjoyment of or your use of my product, I would immediately have had the enjoyment as well as a consciousness of having in my labor satisfied a human need and thus of having objectified the human essence, and so of having provided an object that meets the need of an other human being. I would have, in other words, produced something that is for the consumption of another. I would know that I, in a sense, am engaged in an activity that is going to be connected intrinsically to the satisfaction of the needs of others. From that respect, in a sense, enjoying my own need for my activity, I would be gaining a satisfaction that is tied to the satisfaction of others. Um, I would, he says, in my individual life expression, have directly provided yourself your life expression, and thus in my individual activity, have directly affirmed and objectified my true being, my human, my communal being. This relationship would be reciprocal. That's interesting to ask yourself, what exactly does this involve? It almost seems to give us 
an account of nothing other than commodity relations themselves. Or the relationships one is in in civil society where everyone is in a situation where in order to satisfy their own needs, they must engage in an activity that will furnish what others need. And in that regard, in affirming my own livelihood, I'm equally facilitating the livelihood of others. And what I'm producing is being produced not for any individual need, but for, one could say, need in general, or market need in general. Well, we we'll want to think about what, what, what does this actually involve? What is the nature of a society in which individuals, in a way, in pursuing their individual, particular activities and particular satisfactions are at the very same time upholding those of others and in so doing achieving something of universal significance. We want to see what is that? Is it communism? As something that overcomes private property and commodity relations, or is it something that actually is exhibited in commodity relations themselves? Even if commodity relations may impose certain barriers to aspects of the exercise of this kind of reciprocal uh, self-affirmation. 